Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we take a look at the role of government in the First World War. We hear now from Dr Stuart Halifax about the role of local government in Essex, whose coastline made it vulnerable to German invasion. My name's Stuart Halifax. My focus has been on the experience of the Great War in Essex and how communities responded to it and experienced it, and particularly the role of local leadership and the councils. Essex in 1914 was slightly different to Essex now. It's a county that's directly northeast of London in East Anglia, but it's always had a bit of an overlap with London. So there are areas that are now in London around the Olympic Park, East Ham, West Ham, and further north, Walthamstow and Leytonstone. They were all in Essex. The rest of the county is more like East Anglia, which has market towns and light engineering, towns like Chelmsford, Braintree and Colchester. It had seaside resorts, South End on Sea being the most famous of those at the time and one of the fastest growing places in the country. Then the rest of the county was basically rural and hadn't really changed all that much over the three or four decades before the First World War. One of the ways that councils responded to the war was to set up what they called emergency committees. These focused on the emergency that many people feared of the Germans landing on the English coast, particularly the Essex coast. Before the war, there had been military exercises with the British Army and Navy, seeing how feasible it was to land there. East Anglia in general, the region that Essex is in, was identified as being at risk. The book, The Riddle of the Sands, has invasion plans based around East Anglia. If there was an invasion, martial law would have seen the military take over the roads and railways and be able to kick people out of the coastal areas. The local councils had to figure out what they would do with their local population. They organised a system where they identified people who would gather at certain places with vehicles to take people who couldn't walk taking cattle and crops with them or destroying it and getting out of the way of where they thought the battlefield would be. This planning started from the beginning of the war and continued right the way through the war because the Germans were operating in the North Sea and were able to attack the East Coast. One of the main concerns from the start of the war was around recruitment for the armed forces. Recruiting for the armed forces in First World War Britain had two distinct phases. The first one was a voluntary system and the second conscription, which came in at the beginning of 1916. Councils played a role in recruiting right from the start of the war, along with other local leaders, what I'd term local elites, which could be political elites or local landowners or religious leaders. They all came together to promote enlisting in the armed forces as the thing that men should be doing, particularly young single men. Councils played their role in public speeches, Speaking through the press, they could help pay people who worked for the council who'd joined up to supplement their army pay so that their families wouldn't go short. They could take practical steps to facilitate recruitment. East Ham, West Ham and Colchester Town Hall were all used as recruiting offices. They used their personnel to do a lot of the paperwork. They registered all people of military age in a national register that people were assured wasn't to do with conscription, but it was obviously helpful (laughs) once the conscription was needed. When conscription came in, there was a much more direct role for councils in deciding who would actually go, that they were asked to appoint a military service tribunal, which was initially a committee of the council, but it was expanded It could include agricultural representatives, trade union representatives, or people who knew certain local industries very well. So councils across the country, there were nearly 2,000 across Great Britain, were asked to decide cases where people had appealed against being called up. This meant that they were making decisions about whether people should go into the army or not. If someone thought that they shouldn't, whether that was a valid reason Appeals could be made on the basis of their business obligations, family situation, the domestic hardship that might be caused by them joining up, or their medical fitness if they didn't think that they had been fairly assessed by the military, or conscientious objection. If the tribunals are remembered at all, it's for their 
sometimes very harsh treatment of conscientious objectors, which I think showed up some of the flaws in the system. But really, it was a very small number, only two or three percent of cases were conscience cases. Most were about people's individual circumstances and a need to the local community. The tribunals had to weigh up national and local needs and whether it was best for the community to keep someone who otherwise might be going to the army. This is a quote from the chairman of the tribunal in East Ham, who was also the mayor of East Ham. He described a function of the military service tribunals as being to weigh the merits and demerits of all applications that come before them with a view to ascertaining whether the persons concerned could render more valuable service to the community by remaining in civilian life than by joining the army. They were trying to maintain a balance, as they saw it, between the national need for men to join the army and, to a lesser extent, the navy, and the local need for men. It may be someone who's supporting family members who would otherwise greatly suffer, particularly if they were sick or bedridden parents, wife or children, as well as businesses. If your business would go under, if you left, that might mean you're not going to send your last butcher into the army because you need to have a butcher in the town. At the same time, you might have three butchers that have three slaughtermen. And so instead of having three slaughtermen, one for each butcher, you could rationalise that, send one of those slaughtermen to the army and keep the other two in your town. You would be able to sustain what was needed in your town, but you would also be helping the war effort by sending someone who was fit and able into the army. So it was very much about maintaining a balance. People would get exemptions from military service on the basis that they would help keep another business afloat while that person who ran that business went into the army. Or people would be given exemption from service to support cooperative efforts, a lawyer or an accountant, to make sure that things continued locally. The tribunals were very busy. In the first six months of conscription, something like three-quarters of a million men appealed to the tribunals, which is around the same as the number of men who enlisted during that period. Some of those men who enlisted would have been people who had appealed to the tribunals and failed. In Ilford, they had nearly 1,900 cases over that first six months of the war. In Chelmsford, they had 450 cases heard at 14 meetings of the tribunal in that period. In South End, the local newspaper had a very nice cartoon depicting four or five members of the tribunal snowed under with appeal applications. There were numerous local bodies set up during the war or existing local bodies that had a war function. Ernest Bratchell from Hornchurch, a village near Romford, served on no fewer than 31 public bodies during the war. These included the local council and the fire brigade committee, which he was already the chairman of. Others were war-specific bodies. For example, he was the chair of the Romford Food Control Committee and its military service tribunal, the Food Economy Committee and the Housing and Town Planning Committee. He was also the vice chair of the Distress Committee and a member of the Local Emergency Committee and War Pensions Committee. One of the most important committees set up by the local councils during the war were the food control committees. This was part of a national scheme around food control. In the second half of the war, there were increasing problems with food supply, particularly with food distribution. So local food control committees had a role both enforcing things that were decided at a national level, but also trying to organise things locally, particularly around rationing, which came in for certain foods in 1916, 1917. Over the winter of 1917-1918, there was a big problem with the distribution of food around meat and margarine, a substitute food for butter, which people almost never got during the war. So you got huge queues forming all across the county, the larger towns, and especially in the bit of Essex in East London, Walthamstow, East Ham, West Ham. The councils tried to distribute the food so that these queues would be smaller and more numerous. The chairman of the Food Control Committee in Colchester describes meeting the arrival of the Maypole Dairies margarine delivery. Maypole was one of the main, what were then called multiple stores, but we would think of them as chain stores. There were 2,000 people waiting in Colchester for the arrival of this margarine. So Councillor Jarman, a couple of other members of the Food Control Committee and the executive officer met this van and climbed up onto its running board and told the crowd that they wouldn't be able to buy the margarine straight away, but it would be distributed to 12 different sites across the town. So the crowd dispersed. They then knew that they wouldn't have to queue for hours to get it. They would have shorter queues at different places. 
it was clear that they needed some kind of rationing scheme. And although they tried to set these up in different areas, there was always a sense that people were going into other districts and taking the food that was rightfully in that district. The food control committees were able to do a certain amount locally, but they really needed a regional rationing system, which came in at the end of February 1918 the London and home counties rationing scheme that was about a fifth of the population of England meant you knew that everyone had the same rationing system. You didn't get that sense of unfairness because you could only buy a certain amount of food. Things were also distributed better and the queues disappeared almost overnight. Then that spread out to be a national scheme. There was still a role for the food control committees, but it was more administrative setting up what were called national kitchens. These days we might call them food banks, where people could go and get food. The histories of English local government don't tend to talk about the First World War very much, but if you look at the local experience of the First World War, as I did in Essex, the local councils were vitally important during the war. That was Dr Stuart Halifax on the role of local government in Essex during the First World War. You have been listening to The British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Edward Madigan about how the First World War was seen by many at the time as a profoundly moral war and the role of the churches in creating that perception.